Before we begin the presentation, a note on the current situation. We recognize that this is an unprecedented time, and as such, contractors participating in Efficiency Vermont programs are required to comply with all applicable local, state, and federal laws, rules, regulations, actions, orders, and directives of any authority, including, but not limited to, health and safety regulations, such as OSHA and VOSHA requirements, and public health restrictions, such as the governor's executive orders related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Our first priority is the safety, health, and well-being of our staff, customers, and partners. Here is a list of resources available to support your business's compliance at this time. Office of Governor Phil Scott's Executive Orders, State of Vermont, Agency of Commerce and Community Development Sector-Specific Guidance for Businesses, World Health Organization's Guidance for Employees and Workers, U.S. Department of Labor, Occupational Safety and Health Administration Guidelines on Preparing Workplaces for COVID-19. We will remind you of these resources and provide information on accessing the resources at the end of the presentation. Welcome to the Introduction to Indoor Air Quality, Module 1, Training from Efficiency Vermont. I'm Laura Katz, and I'm excited to walk you through this course. This training is intended for Efficiency Excellence Network members. We'd like to thank South Face Energy Institute, the National Healthy Homes Training Center and Network, and the U.S. Center for Disease Control and Prevention for images used in this presentation. Efficiency Vermont provides this presentation for informational purposes only. Efficiency Vermont does not claim this presentation to be all-inclusive nor exhaustive with regard to the subject matter. It is not in the purview of this presentation to address specifics of a particular home or environment or to provide guidance on diagnosing or treating occupant health problems or occupants building related illness. The content of this presentation shall not be considered legal or medical advice or a substitute for consultation with a licensed physician or an attorney. Individuals, companies, and organizations that wish to use any content from this presentation shall obtain permission from Efficiency Vermont prior to use and consult their own legal and medical professionals. This presentation is not intended to create and the receipt of it does not constitute a physician-patient relationship or an attorney-client relationship. It is the user's and the recipient's responsibility to follow all applicable federal, state, and local requirements and to use good judgment in using this presentation. All questions regarding this presentation should be referred to Efficiency Vermont staff. This course is broken into three modules. Module 1 describes the common indicators of poor indoor air quality, identifies common pollutants and situations that cause poor indoor air quality, and explains low-cost techniques for quantifying poor indoor air quality. Module 2 lists in order of priority the steps for improving indoor air quality and common strategies used. Module 2 also takes a deep dive into ventilation. Module 3 provides tips for knowledgeably talking with customers about the customer's indoor air quality, recommendations for improvement, and relevant Efficiency Vermont offerings, and explains the EEN Healthy Home Contractor Trade Group and how to join. This course is an introduction to indoor air quality. Those interested in diving deep should check out the information provided in Module 3 regarding the Efficiency Excellence Network Healthy Home Contractor Trade Group. This recording covers Module 1. Let's get started with Section 1, Why IAQ Matters. Indoor air quality matters for many reasons. We suspect you're most interested in the ways indoor air quality impacts the building and its occupants. Poor indoor air quality can dramatically shorten the design life of a building and its systems. One example of this is high indoor humidity. Consistently elevated humidity levels that are not intentional meaning the building wasn't designed to have an indoor swimming pool or steam room, can quickly degrade building materials and systems. Common signs include swelling of materials made from cellulose, peeling paint, mold, rot, rust, and delamination of materials containing adhesives. In Vermont, mold growth on interior window sills is common in winter months due to poor window insulation values and high indoor humidity levels. In addition to impacting building and system durability and performance, indoor air quality can greatly impact the building occupants. Most Americans spend over 90% of their time indoors on average. 
Top of mind today is the impact of IOQ on viral spread. Studies show that having too low or too high relative humidity increases viral transmission among people. Additionally, having high particulate matter in the air provides virus particles ample opportunities for hitchhiking, increasing their chances of being inhaled by an occupant. Underventilating spaces keeps more pollutants trapped inside, also increasing the potential for those pollutants to be inhaled or ingested by occupants. Prior to the COVID pandemic, IAQ was rarely thought of as impacting viral spread outside of hospitals, but research was emerging and gaining interest for monitoring schools and high-density businesses for airborne viral transmission. IAQ has other occupant health implications, and those are covered throughout this presentation. IAQ can also impact occupant performance. Studies show reduction in cognitive function in underventilated buildings leading to poor worker and student performance. High indoor carbon dioxide levels can negatively impact sleep and are often an indicator of other IAQ concerns. As you may already know and will further uncover during this presentation, indoor air quality has a big impact on buildings and the people inside them. You'll notice that we don't provide a definition for good indoor air quality in this presentation. That's because the specific parameters for IAQ are highly dependent on the building materials and systems, space use, and occupant needs. ASHRAE provides building type and use specific conditioning information, which may be used to further define the parameters for good indoor air quality in a given building. The World Health Organization and the U.S. Centers for Disease Control provide additional information on IAQ specific to occupant health. Another great resource is For Health, a healthy buildings research and education project by Harvard University. Defining good indoor air quality for the location in question is important to ensuring building durability and occupant health. Now that we've covered why indoor air quality matters, let's discuss common indicators of poor indoor air quality in section two. Think about it. When was the last time you thought about the air quality in a space? Close your eyes and take a minute to remember everything you were sensing in that moment. Was there an odor? Perhaps you could see something in the air or other visual clues on the surfaces. Did your eyes water or itch? Were you sneezing more than usual? Or maybe you could hear something that caused you to wonder about the quality of the air. If you haven't already opened your eyes, do so now. Odors that linger for more than an hour are a common indicator of poor indoor air quality. If you currently use cologne, perfumes, scented laundry soap, dryer sheets, other scented personal care products, cleaning products, or air fresheners, you'll have a harder time picking up on odors than those that use unscented products. You know that phrase, smells like home? Well, home shouldn't really have a distinguishable odor, but for many of us, it does. In addition to odors, visual clues go a long way. There's obvious things like smoke, soot over a fireplace, mold or mold-like substances growing on surfaces, rodent poop, and lack of cleaning. Furry pets and household dust can also be clues if not properly managed. These are all visible signs of poor indoor air quality, but it's often the things that we can't see and may not be able to smell that are the most harmful to our health. These invisible pollutants are often called volatile organic compounds, or VOCs, and fine particulate matter. While using your senses is a great way to detect air quality concerns, diagnostic testing can be used to find hidden and invisible issues. Air quality testing is discussed in section three of this module. Other useful diagnostic tests include infiltration testing, pressure testing, combustion safety testing, and moisture mapping. To learn more about these valuable tools, take a Building Performance Institute exam prep course for building analyst, healthy home evaluator, or similar certification, or hire an Efficiency Excellence Network Home Performance or Healthy Home Contractor. Common health indicators for poor IAQ include watery or itchy eyes, 
dry or runny noses, flu-like symptoms, high blood pressure, poor mental health, and or difficulty breathing. Symptoms may be persistent, like chronic sinus infections or viral infections, or intermittent. Some health symptoms associated with poor indoor air quality will improve once the individual spends time in a location with good indoor air quality. One example of this is low-level carbon monoxide poisoning on an otherwise healthy individual. While exposed to the pollutant overnight, the individual may wake up drowsy, achy, and nauseous, but after a few hours away from home, their symptoms may subside, only to return the following morning. Some poor IAQ exposures may take several weeks of improved IAQ for the individual to experience an improvement in health. One example of this is when individuals notice an improvement after going on an extended vacation, only to worsen when they come home. While other health symptoms associated with poor indoor air quality, such as learning disorders and joint and muscle pain caused by lead poisoning, will not go away without medical intervention to remove the lead from the bloodstream and even then may be irreversible. Only medical professionals can diagnose IAQ-related health symptoms. Let's review what we've just covered. Common indicators of poor indoor air quality include odors, visual clues, diagnostic test results, and health symptoms. In Section 3, we'll explore common indoor pollutants and situations that lead to poor IQ. Let's get started. Buildings are filled with pollutants, and new pollutants are regularly generated by the occupants. Pollutants can come from burning of wood and fossil fuels, cooking, cleaning, bathing and personal care, pets and pests, building materials and furnishings, and outdoor and below ground sources. Common pollutants from wood and pellet systems include fine and large particulates and smoke. These pollutants enter the home during loading and cleaning and can sneak in during operation through infiltration. In Vermont valleys, outdoor air can become heavily polluted with fine particulate matter from older wood-burning stove smoke and cause respiratory illness in the community. Newer EPA certified stoves undergo testing to check for the amount of pollutants released during burning. Improperly vented pellet stoves have the potential to backdraft, bringing fine particulates and smoke into tight homes. Storing firewood in a basement can lead to excess moisture in the home, causing condensation on cold surfaces such as windows and behind furniture on exterior walls. Excess condensation can lead to mildew and mold growth. Burning fossil fuels produces toxic gases and fine particulates. Improperly vented furnaces, boilers, water heaters, gas fireplaces, cooktops, and ovens can be a major source of IAQ pollution in a home. Unvented gas fireplaces, space heaters, cooktops, and ovens are known to be a health hazard. Cooking produces fine particulates and moisture. Cooking on a gas cooktop also produces unhealthy gases. When not properly vented to the exterior, these pollutants may be inhaled and get into the occupant's bloodstream causing long-term health effects. Recirculating vent fans do not remove these pollutants from the home. Vent fans exhausted directly to the exterior are needed. Cleaning is important for maintaining a healthy home. The products chosen and the methods used to clean a home can have a positive or negative impact on the indoor air quality. My colleague has a basic rule for finding non-toxic cleaning chemicals. Would you drink it? If you would, it's probably less likely to cause an IAQ issue. Equally important to the products you use is how you clean. Sweeping and dry dusting doesn't remove the particulates of most concern. It just moves them around and resuspends them in the air. Those resuspended dust particles end up right back into the air for inhalation by occupants. Choosing a HEPA vacuum is important to reduce fine particulate matter, exhaust from the vacuum, and to trap those pollutants for safe removal from the home. Dusting with a damp cloth will safely trap more pollutants. Other chemicals may be found in homes related to home maintenance or hobbies. These chemicals may off-gas pollutants as well. In addition to breathing, cooking, and combustion, bathing and showering increases indoor humidity. Ventilation fans exhausted to the exterior need to be used whenever moisture is being generated inside the home. High efficiency ventilation fans can recover some of the heat that is in the exhausted airstream and use that to preheat the incoming makeup air, 
to reduce energy costs associated with ventilation, and to improve comfort. These systems are known as HRVs, or heat recovery ventilators. In rooms where ventilation systems do not exhaust to the exterior, windows need to be used during and after activities that generate excess moisture, despite the comfort issues and energy losses open windows may cause. Dehumidifiers can help maintain indoor relative humidity between 40 and 55%. Relative humidity below 40% decreases immunity and causes comfort issues. Relative humidity above 55% promotes the growth of dust mites, a known allergen. Relative humidity above 70% encourages mold growth. Remember, maintain indoor relative humidity between 40 and 55% for health and durability. Because relative humidity is relative to the temperature of the air, Bringing warmer, seemingly drier air into a cool basement in the summer can create high levels of relative humidity and cause condensation, leading to mold growth over time. In this example, the basement air is 65 degrees Fahrenheit and 50% relative humidity. The dehumidifier is doing a great job. Outside, it is 85 degrees Fahrenheit and 40% relative humidity. You think, hey, I'm going to save some money by turning off that dehumidifier and bringing in the dry outdoor air. Better yet, I'm also going to open the door between the basement and the house and set up a fan to cool off the inside of the home with that basement air while replacing the basement air with the drier outside air. Half an hour goes by and you go down to close the basement to house door because the air coming into the home is no longer as cool. While doing this, you notice the relative humidity in the basement is now 70%. This is due to the outdoor air dropping in temperature when entering the basement while having the same amount of water vapor in the air, leading to a higher relative humidity. Suddenly, you realize your plan has backfired, and instead of having a drier basement, you now have wetter air and need to turn that dehumidifier back on. A similar problem can occur in the winter. It's a cold and windy evening, and your home air feels uncomfortably dry. You check the relative humidity meter in your bedroom and are shocked to see it's at 10%. You set a pot of water on the wood stove in the living room and bask in the cozy steam bath it provides. A few hours go by, and you're ready to call it a night. You go to close the curtains in your room only to find your window dripping with water. You check the relative humidity, and it's only at 35%. So what went wrong? Well, let's take a look at the temperature of the window. Your window is only 34 degrees Fahrenheit, which is well below the dew point of 49 degrees. So while the relative humidity is fine in the room, on this particular surface, it is causing condensation. The healthiest way to fix this is to improve the temperature of the window. One way of doing this is installing a low-E storm window. If this house had triple pane windows, you probably wouldn't have noticed this issue, as the glass temperature would have likely stayed above the dew point. This illustrates the importance of understanding temperature and relative humidity in buildings, especially in relation to indoor air quality. Scented personal care products, laundry detergents, dryer sheets, and air fresheners are common sources for indoor air quality pollutants. Often, people who use these products have a desensitized sense of smell and do not realize how prolific the off-gassing odors can be. Elderly individuals have a diminished sense of smell and may be more likely to overuse fragrant products, leading to poor indoor air quality. Anytime an air freshener is used, one should ask, what is the air freshener intended to mask and how might we eliminate the root problem as that problem is likely an IAQ concern? Most of us own pets because we love them and we cannot imagine living without them. Pets can be a high source of pollutants leading to poor indoor air quality. They bring in pollen and dirt, their food attracts pests, and their litter boxes can create fine particulate matter. While furry pets are the biggest culprits, even fish can cause indoor air quality concerns by increasing indoor humidity levels. Pests produce allergens as well and must be treated through integrated pest management. Common pesticides can be hazardous to your indoor air quality and to your health. While rare in Vermont, 
mice can carry hantavirus, causing disease in humans, leading to respiratory failure, and in some cases, even death. Building materials and furnishings contain countless chemicals that break down into dust and off-gas over time. Some of the most hazardous materials are those containing asbestos, lead, PCBs, formaldehyde, and flame retardants. Asbestos, lead, and PCBs were outlawed in building materials years ago, but building materials with these products were widely installed in Vermont. New regulations limit formaldehyde and flame retardants in some materials, but thousands of new products and product reformulations enter the market each year, making it challenging to keep up with the potential air quality hazards. Avoiding materials with added coatings and treatments and choosing all natural products and products with environmental product declarations or certifications, like the DECLARE label, can reduce the potential for harmful substances that cause poor indoor air quality. Plush furnishings trap and hold more pollutants than smooth surface furnishings. Carpets, upholstered furniture, and drapes are all culprits of harboring and releasing pollutants. Choose smooth surface options when possible and ensure any fabrics used are able to be regularly washed in hot water. Air quality pollutants enter buildings from outside through air leaks and foundation cracks. Some homes have dirt basements and crawl spaces allowing soil gases to freely enter the home. Radon is an odorless and colorless gas impacting many homes and buildings in Vermont. Radon is the second leading cause of lung cancer and can only be measured from inside the enclosed building. Outdoor pollutants include vehicle exhaust from busy roadways, smoke and other heating system exhaust in valleys and dense housing areas, pollen, agricultural products like pesticides and herbicides, and wildfires to name a few. Extreme heat, cold, and humidity can also impact indoor air quality and occupant health. Occupants greatly influence indoor air quality as well. Some occupants use ventilation systems when bathing and cooking, others do not. Some occupants install dehumidifiers to reduce the humidity in their home, others install humidifiers. Few occupants measure humidity to inform their system run times. People generate pollutants through their activities and even while sitting still and breathing. The air we breathe out contains carbon dioxide, and over time, without proper ventilation, the carbon dioxide can build up in the space leading to poor indoor air quality. The number of people in a space and the activities occurring in a space impact the amount of outdoor air ventilation required. Underventilating is common in Vermont, and Module 2 of this training will provide an in-depth information for improving ventilation in homes. Now that we've reviewed common indoor air quality pollutants and sources, let's see if you can find issues in the upcoming picture. We'll be sure to throw in a few new pollutant sources to keep you interested. Take a moment to review this image. What visual clues do you see that may indicate poor indoor air quality? Pause the video if needed. You probably notice the cleaning products, as those look most out of place. The cleaning spray may trigger asthma and cause respiratory symptoms. Dry dusting and sweeping should be avoided. Instead, opt for dusting with a damp cloth and vacuuming with a HEPA vacuum. HEPA vacuums are important as you want to catch the fine particulates in the vacuum and not redistribute them across the house. What other IAQ issues do you see in the picture? How about the plants? Plants can provide oxygen and filter chemicals, but if not properly cared for, they can also be a source of mold and excess moisture. Now let's take a closer look. See that stick in the plant? It's an incense stick. Your nose may have found it long before your eyes could. And look at how much dust we can see once the clock is moved. Household dust harbors many chemicals known to be toxic to humans. These particles are an accumulation of off-gas chemicals and allergens released from building materials, people, and pets. Aside from poor housekeeping, heavy dust may be a clue to a larger problem, such as leaky ductwork, air infiltration, or older materials breaking down in the home. Now for the bonus question. 
Where do you suppose the return register is for this floor of the home? I bet you guessed right. It's behind the piano. Keeping return and supply registers free of blocks and clutter allows for better air distribution in the home. Adding MERV 13 or higher filters on the air handler can further improve indoor air quality. Let's look at a few more pictures and see what we can find. What strikes you about these images? Hint, the pictures on the left is a close-up of the top of a water heater. The picture on the top right is a flue pipe in the basement. The picture on the bottom right is ductwork in a crawl space. Many people will assume that dust on the water heater in the basement or closet has no impact on the rest of the home. It's in a closet after all. However, a trained professional knows that dust or rust on an atmospherically vented water heater is a clear sign of backdrafting. Backdrafting is a term used when gases intended to go out of the home through the flue pipe are pulled back into the home due to the pressure inside of the home being more negative than the pressure in the flue pipe. Backdrafting is a serious indoor air quality issue and must be addressed immediately by a certified professional. The disconnected flue pipe on the top right picture is also a serious health issue as those noxious flue glasses are spilling into the basement and may be pulled into the main living area of the home. The ductwork on the bottom right has been disconnected. If this is a supply duct, the conditioned air is dumping into the crawl space and creating a negative pressure inside the home. If this is a return duct, the system is now pulling in dusty and damped crawl space air and redistributing it throughout the home. In both cases, this is a sign of poor indoor air quality. In these pictures, we see signs of moisture, which can also indicate indoor air quality concerns. The top left image is condensation on a window, a sign that the relative humidity in the home may be too high or the thermal performance of the window may be too low. The bottom left image is mold-like growth or dust accumulation around an attic access. This indicates that the attic access and surrounding drywall is not well insulated, creating a cold surface for moisture to accumulate on and subsequently dust to accumulate and mold to potentially grow. The top right picture is the result of a leaky refrigerator. The leak may be from the ice maker water line or from the drain pan overflowing and not evaporating water properly. The bottom right picture is a stud wall in a basement. It shows water damage on the wood. Much harder to see in the image are the spider webs with dust accumulation. Spiders make their webs in areas of airflow. Air movement is a good indicator of a contamination pathway between conditioned and unconditioned spaces. Contamination pathways allow pollutants and pests to come into the home. Now that we have a taste of what common pollutants are found indoors and situations that lead to poor indoor air quality, let's review ways we can monitor and quantify indoor air quality in Section 4. Before selecting a monitoring device, the first question we need to answer is what do I want to measure and how will I use the data I collect? Our answer to this question will vary based on the specific building being investigated and the occupants that use the space. IAQ monitors vary greatly by the pollutants measured, the measurement scale used, accuracy, and price. At Efficiency Vermont, we've used about a dozen monitors, and what we've found to be most reliable for low-cost indoor air quality assessments is measuring temperature, relative humidity, carbon dioxide, fine particulate matter, nitrogen dioxide, radon, and low-level carbon monoxide. You'll notice that we don't have VOCs on this list, while we'd love to measure these in every home we touch, we've not found a low-cost, reliable monitor that measures VOCs. Most VOC monitors ascertain VOC levels using an algorithm based on other pollutants measured by the monitor. Since this is not an accurate representation of true VOC content, we avoid using those monitoring systems. As previously discussed, we intentionally avoid providing a definition for good indoor air quality in this presentation. For the purpose of providing examples, we will use residential specific parameters for the pollutants we commonly measure at Efficiency Vermont. Temperature levels to achieve occupant comfort in a home can vary. The World Health Organization recommends an indoor temperature of at least 64 degrees Fahrenheit in homes with healthy adults and 68 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit 
and homes with babies or elderly residents. Studies have found that indoor daytime temperature of at least 68 degrees and nighttime temperatures of at least 64 degrees can reduce symptoms for people with respiratory issues. Equally important in keeping a home warm in the winter is ensuring it doesn't become too hot in the summer. From a health perspective, the ideal indoor relative humidity is 50%. Going below 40% relative humidity decreases the body's immune system and increases the potential for airborne viral spread. 55% relative humidity is the threshold for dust mites and 70% is the threshold for mold growth. Homes with poor insulation or moderate performance windows must accommodate for condensation potential in the winter on cold surfaces, even when relative humidity is well below the ideal threshold for health. Additionally, most Vermont basements will require some dehumidification during parts of the year. Carbon dioxide, abbreviated as CO2, is commonly measured in parts per million, or PPM. There is no specified threshold for residences in Vermont. However, codes target 1,000 ppm for workplaces. Because it's easy and cheap to measure CO2 in real time, and because CO2 is reliably created in every occupied space, CO2 is often used as a proxy indicator for overall indoor air quality. However, CO2 levels are dependent upon occupancy. You can have a minimally occupied space with low CO2 and very high VOCs or other pollutants. If materials are off-gassing or other pollutants are entering the space at a higher rate than the CO2 is being produced, CO2 measurements would not provide an accurate representation of the overall indoor air quality. Likewise, if you use CO2 readings taken during unusually high occupancy events, that are rare occasions, the data will not accurately represent the air quality of the space for most of the time. This point stresses the importance of defining site-specific IAQ parameters and the complexity of quantifying actual IAQ. Be sure to use all available data for estimating actual indoor air quality in any given space. Fine particulate matter, or PM2.5, are the particles of most concern for health purposes, but PM10 is also important. Monitors may measure PM10, PM2.5, or both. In low-cost air quality monitors, particulate matter is commonly measured with photometers and optical particle counters. The results are reported in mass concentration or occasionally in parts per million. Indoor PM levels should be at or below outdoor levels. The World Health Organization 2006 guideline for indoor PM2.5 is 10 micrograms per cubic meter or less. Some monitors will convert PM measurements into air, air quality indexed, or AQI, for ease of customer interpretation. In homes, the main source of nitrogen dioxide, abbreviated as NO2, is the combustion of fossil fuels. Homes on major roadways may experience increased NO2 from combustion vehicles. Studies have shown gas stoves to be the dominant activity influencing indoor NO2 concentrations in most homes. Unvented gas space heaters also create elevated NO2 levels. Average levels of NO2 in homes without combustion appliances is about half that of outdoors. No standards have been agreed upon for nitrogen oxide levels in indoor air. ASHRAE and the U.S. EPA National Ambient Air Quality Standards List provide 0.053 ppm as the average 24-hour limit for NO2 in indoor air. Efficiency Vermont uses passive samplers for measuring NO2 in homes and outside. Passive samplers are low cost but do not provide real-time results. Gas analyzers may be used for real-time data reporting but are much more expensive. Radon can only be accurately measured inside the building on the lowest occupied level while the building is in winter mode. In other words, all exterior windows and doors are closed for the duration of the test. The most accurate radon tests are long-term and cover an entire heating season. The Vermont Department of Health offers free long-term radon testing to all Vermonters. Long-term testing isn't always viable in those cases where we need a faster test result. 
In that situation, we use a four to seven day test following EPA guidelines for testing procedures. In addition to passive samplers, electronic monitors are available and used by many radon mitigation contractors for verifying system performance. You may be wondering why we have low level carbon monoxide on the list when every home in Vermont is required to have a CO alarm. Note that most carbon monoxide alarms are designed to alert occupants to very high levels of carbon monoxide and are not effective in preventing respiratory exasperations and sensitive populations such as those with asthma, COPD, young children, and senior citizens. Underwriters Laboratory, UL Standard 2034 allows for 30 ppm for up to 30 days, 70 ppm for up to 4 hours, 150 ppm for up to 50 minutes, and 400 ppm for up to 15 minutes before sounding the alarm. Given the risk of CO-induced illnesses, we recommend low-level CO monitoring as part of every indoor air quality test kit. To most accurately assess indoor air quality, you also need to measure outdoor air quality so you can assess whether the pollutants are likely generated inside or are coming from outside. The exception to this are carbon monoxide and radon. The longer you monitor the indoor air quality, the more information you can glean. At a minimum, we recommend two weeks unless the test apparatus limits the timeline as it does with short-term radon and nitrogen dioxide testing. In residences, testing for two weeks ensures you experience most activities conducted in the home, such as cooking, cleaning, laundry, hobbies, etc. When working with sensitive populations, alarms may be necessary to proactively alert occupants to hazardous changes in IAQ. One study commented they may have saved lives if their low-level CO monitors had alarms during the study period. Many low-cost monitors are available on the market today. We base our monitor selection on the following criteria. Accuracy as reported by the manufacturer and as confirmed by valid research studies, such as those conducted by Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Ease of setup, use, and data download. Ease of customer interaction with the device should they wish to receive real-time feedback. Durability, data security, and data ownership customer support, monitor features such as configurable alarms, and price. As of the time of this recording, Efficiency Vermont offers free indoor air quality monitor loans to Vermonters. The monitors we use for the loan program measure temperature, relative humidity, carbon dioxide, and particulate matter. All contractors joining the EEN Healthy Home Contractor Trade Group receive one of these monitors to keep for use in delivering Energy Plus Health Services and Healthy Home Energy Assessments. Be sure to also have a low-level CO monitor since this is not captured in the monitor we offer at this time. Other monitors, including that low-level CO monitor, are available for loan by in-network contractors based on request and monitor availability at the time of the request. Take a moment and close your eyes. Think about the information you've gleaned from this presentation. And think about a specific place you know well. Before jumping in to answer the question, what would you measure? Think about the common indicators you can remember from that place. What pollutants and situations that created poor indoor air quality can you remember? What questions would you now want to answer using the data that you could collect with an air quality monitor? How would you use that data? Now answer the question, what will you measure? This concludes Module 1. We hope you enjoyed learning why indoor air quality matters, common indicators of poor IAQ, common pollutants and situations for poor IAQ, and low-cost techniques for quantifying IAQ. Check out Module 2 to learn the steps for improving indoor air quality and common strategies used when improving indoor air quality. Module 2 also takes a deep dive into ventilation. Module 3 provides tips for knowledgeably talking with customers about indoor air quality, recommendations for improvement, and relevant Efficiency Vermont offerings. Module 3 also explains the Efficiency Excellence Network Healthy Home Contractor Trade Group and how to join. 
I hope to see you there. Thank you for taking the time to watch this presentation. We hope you found it useful. To learn more about Healthy Buildings and our Healthy Building programming and to share your feedback about this training, please contact us at the contact information listed on the screen. Together, through efficiency, we will make Vermont homes safe, affordable, comfortable, durable, and resilient, resulting in an improvement in population health and a reduction in greenhouse gases. Goodbye. As noted in the beginning of the presentation, this slide provides a list of resources that we encourage you to visit so that you can learn more about how to comply with all applicable local, state, and federal laws, rules, regulations, actions, orders, and directives of any authority, including, but not limited to, health and safety standards and public health restrictions related to the COVID-19 pandemic. The links on this slide are active. To access them, download the slide deck from the webpage where you access this training recording. Thank you.